you. And it is always a joy to uh, be able to bring the Word of God to you, and uh, it is my highest honor to be here today with you. I want to get right into our text today, and that is uh, found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 10. If you want to make your way to 2 Corinthians, that is the portion that Terry just read for us. We'll be picking up the last couple of verses on that. <clears throat> Many of you are well aware that this time of year, our high school students and college students, perhaps you as well, are facing what is known across this nation as finals week. And I can already sense the groans as we work towards uh, that, that uh, week, the time in which our students will be doing the last minute cramming, trying to get all the details in their heads of all of the coursework that they are going to attempt to demonstrate certain levels of proficiency at. My daughter told me a funny story of one such exam early in her college experience of an exam that she wasn't quite prepared to take. It was a calculus exam, and uh, she arrived somewhat unstudied and ill-prepared for this exam. When she opened the exam, she realized she was definitely in over her head as she saw page after page of calculus problems that she was not ready to work through. She realized fairly soon into that that she was not likely to pass this exam. Well, in the last-ditch effort to salvage what she could from this experience, she wanted to redeem the situation and page to the back of her exam booklet, which was a blank sheet of paper, upon which she began to write out her Christian testimony. <laughs> she spoke of the love of God and her newfound faith and the grace of God which had invaded her life and hopes that her professor would also be invaded by that grace and perhaps return a little bit of that grace to her in this exam. <laughs> well, she turned in that exam and she never looked back. And she never found out what she got on that exam. And while no doubt she may have failed that earthly exam that day, it is entirely possible that she may have passed with flying colors a heavenly exam, a heavenly exam given by Christ and not man. Ladies and gentlemen, today we are preparing for a final exam. You and I are all preparing for an ultimate exam, an exam not given on earth and not given by man, but proctored, as it were, by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Indeed, we are preparing for our final exam. I've entitled this message, Our Final Exam, taken from our cue in verse 10, that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. This morning, I'm going to share with you six crucial aspects of our final exam, six aspects which will cause us, if paid attention to, to minimize earthly regret and maximize our usefulness for Christ and for his kingdom and for heaven. And the purpose today, ladies and gentlemen, is strictly this. I just want to encourage you today. I just want to motivate you today that in light of our resources in Christ, that you live for your Lord with full throttle. I want you to live a burning hot life for Christ. I don't want you to be passive today, and I want you to understand that it is for the kingdom of heaven in which we labor and strive, and to keep an ever-present consciousness of the awareness that we will one day stand before our Lord for an assessment. Well, let's look into these six subjects. If you're taking notes, there's probably some room in your bulletin to, to track all these today. I'll share each one with you. Let's look at the very first, taken from our text, the subjects of this judgment. The subjects of this judgment. Who will Christ judge? Who will um, be the subjects of this judgment? I submit to you this morning that it is all Christians. All Christians will be judged. The text says it in verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And here Paul is referring to Christians. 
Now we know all men, great or small, will be judged before the Lord at the great white throne judgment. That's found in Revelation 20. That's where the dead are resurrected. And any whose names are not written in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, will be cast into the lake of fire. We are aware of that final judgment of the lost, but this is not that judgment. This is the judgment of the saved. We know this is referring to Christians because if you look in all of the prior verses which Terry had read this morning, we see all of these personal pronouns which refer to us as believers. Verse 1, for we know that if the earthly tent which is our house is torn down, we have a building from God. Uh, it talks about how we groan and, we, and we, we long to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. And in verse 4, um, indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan. But verse 5, he who prepared for us this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. Clearly speaking about redeemed believers here, only believers have the Spirit. And therefore, being of good courage, we know that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And so, verse 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, verse 8. And verse 9, therefore, we have our ambition to please him. Clearly speaking about believers, so when we come to verse 10, when he says we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, he's speaking about the very same group of believers. This is important to understand that Paul is not addressing the lost here, but the saved, not the, the goats, as it were, but the sheep, the flock of God, not unbelievers, but believers. And that's no surprise to us when we read something like this in 1 Peter 4, 17, where he says, for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. That is the starting point of God's judgment of all humanity. He will judge all humanity, but he will start with his own, with his saints, with believers. You ask, well, if this is, if this is a, a judgment of believers, is it a corporate judgment? In other words, will we, like today, just kind of corporately attend this and kind of be the subjects as a whole? I don't believe so. While we will be there as a whole, no doubt, there is some individuality put to this where he says, for we must all appear, look down lower, that each one, each one may be recompensed for his deeds done in the body, his deeds done in the body. And so here is a particularity on this. This is describing a personal, individual nature of this judgment. Yes, corporately, no doubt, we will stand as a church, but each and every one of us will also stand to receive reward. This text has your name written on it. This text has my name written on it. If we are believers in God, we are part of his household and we will stand before him. These are the subjects of this judgment. It's us. It's us. Well, let's continue and look at our second point, the certainty of this judgment. We've seen who is going to be here but is this really going to happen? Uh, look at the text here. We must all appear before the judgment of seat of Christ. And what I'd like to draw your attention to is that little word in your text that says must. That is the Greek word day. It's a common word. It's a word that simply means this is an absolute necessity. This is a guaranteed certainty. This must happen. This has to happen. This marks a requirement of personal attendance to this exam, compulsory attendance to this exam. There is certainty to this. There is an element of necessity and inescapability and unavoidability and inevitability to this exam. Students, your mother cannot excuse you for this exam. You cannot skip this final. You cannot be marked absent, and you cannot call in sick. There will be no missed appointments. This evaluation, this judgment is certain. And what must we do at this judgment? Again, to the text, for we must all appear, it says. We must all appear. 
Now, please understand that this word appear does not simply mean that we'll just all kind of show up, mark our attendance, and there we are, all is well. Now, there's more to this word. The, the, the word is the Greek word phanerao, and it means so much more than just showing up, but it is marking the certainty that there will be a manifestation occurring at this appearance. It's not just that you're present, it's that you are present and there will be a manifestation of who you are at this judgment seat of Christ. The core meaning of this word means to manifest or to cause to be made visible or known. It means to expose something publicly that has been hidden or unknown. It means to reveal openly and to make clear. That's what we're going to be doing at this certain appearance, is that we will be made clear. It, Philip Hughes, in his commentary on 2 Corinthians, writes this, To be made man manifest means not just to appear, but to be laid bare, stripped of every outward facade of respectability, and openly revealed in the full and true reality of one's character. That's what this word means. You're not just going to be there. You're going to be there to be exposed and revealed for who you really are. We will be unmasked that day. We wear masks all day on earth. We mask ourselves to others, our friends, our acquaintances, our spouse. We wear masks constantly. In this day, we will be unmasked completely before our Lord. We will be laid bare. We will be subject to total transparency, total vulnerability. And we will be naked, as it were, before our Lord. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 5 says, When the Lord comes, he will bring to light the things hidden in darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. You say, well, Eli, I don't believe that. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter because this exam is certain. And you can say the same thing about gravity and say, well, I don't believe in gravity. But just as sure as you're sitting in your seats, gravity is affecting its work upon you. And you can put gravity to the test to your own demise as well as the judgment seat of Christ. But if you are a Christian, from the day you were born, yea, verily, born again, there is a countdown that is occurring every year, every month, every week, every day, every moment, every second of time is bringing us closer to our certain destiny, destiny our predestined destiny, to stand before Christ. And for all we need to know now is that this is certain. Let's look at another point here as we develop this text. The subjects are Christians. The certainty, it is a must. Thirdly, the location. Where is this going to be? The location of this judgment. Where is the setting? Where will this occur? Look at verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. This is the location this is that famous Greek word, the bema, the bema seat of Christ. The, the bema in, in Greek history was a, was a step. It was a raised podium, probably not a lot different than this. It was a pedestal, steps leading up to it. It was a platform where tribunals could occur, a judgment seat. Even in today's courts, there's a raised platform for the judge, a, a bema of sorts, in Koine Greek, this bema was the official seat of a judge or a magistrate. It's used of Pilate in Matthew 27, 19, judging Jesus on the bema. Interesting, isn't it? We'll come back to that. It's used in Acts 12, 21 of Herod building a bema resembling a throne that he called the rostrum. And he would dress, it says, in royal apparel and address his people. It's a place of a dignitary. Acts 18, Paul is brought before the judgment seat, the bema of Gallio, you remember? And remember, Gallio said, I don't want anything to do with this mess. Good judgment, sound judgment. And Acts 25 and verse 6, it's translated the tribunal of Festus, the bema of Festus, the bema of Caesar. It's a big deal to stand at a bema. 
Well, in classical Greek, this word bema stood for the center platform upon which the Olympic Games were judged and rewarded. And, and after the games and after all the competitions, the competitors would all be lined up and brought to the bema, and they would stand before the judge or judges, and the one who ran his race according to the rules, who buffeted his body, who disciplined himself, would be crowned with the words, well done, and given the Stephanos, the victor's wreath, the victor's crown. They were at the bema. And the one who came in last didn't get shot. Of course not, because they didn't have bullets back then. But they didn't execute the person that came in last. He just didn't win the Stephanos. It's a very important concept to be understanding as we look at this word, the bema seat of Christ. This, will you note, by the way, is not the bema of Caesar, of Festus, of Gallio, of, of Pontius Pilate. This is the bema seat, will you note, of Christ. Not a senator or a governor or an Olympic official, not of man, not of angels, not even of yourself, right? The judgment seat of self, because sometimes we can be very hard on ourselves and sometimes we can be too easy on ourselves and none of this will happen. We will get an accurate judgment from Christ drawing attention to the fact that the Messiah, the Messiah will be this king and judge of his people. The Messiah, right, who was judged by man and given a faulty judgment will reverse the roles and will judge man and be given an accurate judgment. Before we leave this point, will you note that the text says that we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ? That's very important. Every word is important. We will not stand above the judgment seat of Christ. We will not stand beneath it. We will not stand behind it. We will not stand before it or anywhere else. I'm sorry, next to it. We will stand before him in his full, glorious appearance to his saints. This is our location of our final exam, the immediate presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I give you a fourth one? We've seen the subjects, the certainty, and the location. How about the purpose of this judgment? The purpose of this judgment. Why does this have to happen? The purpose of this judgment, according to our text, is recompense. It is recompense. Note that we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds done in the body. This idea of recompense is one that concerns us a little bit because we immediately have to ask ourselves the question, is this talking about our sins? Is he going to bring our sins to light at the Bema Seat of Christ? It's a very important question. Good-thinking Christians think in terms of categories, and theology and the Bible comes to us really in categories, and what I need you to understand here before we move on in this lesson is that the Bible makes it very clear that our sins in Christ are forgiven. He takes our sins, we take his righteousness, and they are forever forgiven. We need to understand that. In fact, the book of Isaiah says that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's good news. As, as impossible as it would be to bring east and west together is just as impossible to bring your sins back to you, judiciously speaking, right? Categories in a judicial sense. Uh, the Bible also talks about God throwing those sins behind his back to where he can't even see them. Of course, we know God is omniscient. We know he can see all things, but our sins he, he positions behind him. It also speaks as our sins being buried in the depths of the sea. And it would be like if you were on an, an ocean liner playing with a coin and you're flipping this coin and, and the coin goes overboard and it enters the water and disappears deeper and deeper and deeper to the bottom of the sea. No man ever could find that and retrieve that. And I submit to you, your sins 
weighed much more than a little coin, right? It was a bag of rocks. It was a load of rocks that goes deep down into the sea, never to be retrieved again. Your sins, past, present, and future. You say, my future sins? A lot of people struggle with my future sins. Well, folks, at one point in time, all your sins were future, right? They were all future. At the cross, they were all seen ahead of time. So yes, past, present, and future, your sins are forgiven. You are justified. Let's lock that in place. However, however, even though you are justified, you must still give an account. Not for your sins, but for your service. It's a very important theological distinction that this text presents to us. You will not have to be accountable for your sins, but for your service. And there yet is still a connection because we live in a sin-cursed world, sin-cursed body. And so we're serving ever present with sin. But we'll get to that in just a moment. The purpose here is recompense. And there's no cheap grace involved with this. That is to say, you cannot say, well, great, my sins are taken care of, I got my fire insurance, I got my ticket to heaven, so I'll just live any old way I want now. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way because we are accountable for our service, and you're in a fantasy world if you think it does. What's under review in this examination is our service, and we will appear not as a sinner to a judge, praise God, but as a servant to a master. That's how we will appear at the judgment seat of Christ. The text says that, uh, meaning in order that, the purpose of this, that each one, back to that individually, nobody will be missed, nobody will be forgotten, nobody will be overlooked. He may be recompensed. It's a very important word. It means to receive back or to obtain. It means to get back what was owed to you or deserved or to receive your due. Christ is in the business of repaying his people. Christ in his court, the judgment seat of Christ, is going to make good on his promises to reward his people. And this is one of the main differences between earthly tribunals and the heavenly tribunal. Earthly tribunals, the criminal courts, are worried about punitive uh, restoration, punishment, exacting something out of criminals for their crimes, correcting them, making them perform restitution. But I'll tell you, no criminal court ever brings the person up and says, you have done so well in this proceeding that I am going to give you an award, a reward. That's only for Christ. Will you note in the text that it says that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body? What does this mean? Well, it's simply put, this is your your deeds, your works, your habits, your practices done while you are alive on earth. That's all that is. While you're in the body just means here on earth when you're alive. And this means the choices you make. It means the steps you take. It means the path you follow. It means the words you speak. The jobs you perform. The ministries you engage in. Carrying out your service in the body. And will you note that it is according to what he has done, the text says. Deeds in the body according to what he has done. This is an action word here. This, this is a word that implies activity. According to what he has done, again, does not refer to our sins being judged but our works and our service being evaluated. It's no surprise to us when we see Revelation 22, 12, some of the last words of our Lord documented in the, in the Bible, where he says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. To render, there's our word, to pay back to every man. There's the each one individually, according to what he has done. According to what he has done. As I was preparing for this message, even long before I had chosen this text, 
I began to be roused with this sense that I'm going to be accountable for this life that I live. And I'm going to be accountable for the, the opportunities and the skills and the abilities and all the things which God has given me. And this has long since captured my attention, and I hope it does yours. This needs to grip us. Because we cannot just come to Christ and then kick back with any old, you know, whatever happens in life, let it come, let it be, who cares? Nobody's going to ask, nobody's going to know, nobody's going to have to give an account. That is the wrong understanding of the Christian life. You can't be on autopilot. And some of you have been given more training and more opportunities and more giftedness and more natural abilities. And so guess what? Our Lord said, to whom much is given, much is going to be required. And, and I think especially in this church, when I look at the giftedness of all, of the teachers, of the preachers, of the workers in all the Sunday school settings, of the music ministries, of all of the different ministries we have, of, of the Word of God constantly and ever being in front of us week after week, year after year, I sense our high level of accountability here at Parkview. And I hope you do too. To whom much is given, much indeed will be required. And so we don't just become a Christian and watch TV all day and kick it at the beach or the lake or on the golf course. And I'm not mad at the beach and I'm not mad at the lake and I'm not mad at the golf course. That is legitimate recreation. But, I mean, inherent to the word recreation is to recreate yourself, to come away and rest so that you can get back into the race, back into the game of Christian living. We're going to be accountable. That is the purpose of this judgment. We've seen the subjects, it's us. Certainty, a must. Location, right in front of Christ. The purpose to pay back. Let's look fifthly at the standard of this judgment. The standard of this judgment. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Whether good or bad. This is an interesting uh, little addition to the end of this verse here. By what standard will Christ judge us? He will judge us based on the standard, according to this text, of what is good or what is bad. Again, believers are not judged for sin. That's handled at the cross. However, justification by faith alone is not opposed to judgment and assessment and evaluation based on works alone. It is very important to understand those distinctions. James says it this way, faith without works is what? It's dead. And Ephesians speaks about those good works which God has prepared in advance that we should walk in. He's ahead of us on this. Don't, don't get nervous when I say that really we are, we are justified by faith, but we're judged by works. That is, a, that is a Christian reality in the New Testament. And will you note that the text says whether it's good or bad. This simply just means that there will be on that last day as we all stand before Christ individually, there will be a sorting out. There will be a sifting. He will, he will be placing and categorizing our works done in this life, and they will end up in one of two piles, the good pile or the bad pile. There's going to be an evaluation, and those works that are put in the good pile will result in reward for the believer, and those works that are put in the bad pile will result in loss for the believer. Good means agathos, excellent, honorable, useful, of a high standard of quality, acceptable. It could be eternal, spiritual, for the kingdom, for the Lord. And I'll say this, this doesn't mean you have to be a pastor or a missionary or a church worker to have your works end up in this pile. This gentleman could be loving your wives as Christ loved the church. That's a good work. Ladies, this could be loving your children and caring for them and nurturing them. Children, this could be obeying your parents. Just, it, it, it's good works that Christ will repay true believers for doing. 
But will you note, and, and by the way, before I leave that, I just need to say, I, I need to emphasize that because some of you are working so hard. Some of you are giving of yourself so faithfully. And you're serving the Lord in wherever you find yourself. And I just want to say, be of good cheer, be encouraged. You might feel like nobody notices, but I'm telling you, the most important being in the universe has taken note, and he will repay, and his reward is with him. However, not all will be as comforting. It says, good or bad. Phaulos in the Greek it's best to translate this as useless. I know some of your translations say bad, some of them say evil. It's best to understand it as useless. Uh, ordinary is what the word is. Worthless, no account, pertaining to a low grade. Grade B service, substandard. It's ordinary, it's base. This is not necessarily evil deeds that we do, although those would clearly be in that category. These are just deeds that just... They're, they're just nothing deeds. They just amount to a hill of beans, if that. They're, I guess you could say they're just cardboard. It's just scraps. It doesn't do anything for the kingdom or for Christ. And sometimes I wonder if I'll have a lot of things in that pile. Just things that were not necessarily wicked or evil, just, just junk, the, the trash heap. Do these things cause the believer to lose their salvation? No, but they do cause the believer to suffer loss. Loss of reward, loss of Christ's praise, loss of well done, good and faithful servant. Things that could have been, should have been, would have been had you invested wisely. These two piles are best illustrated if you would turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3 where Paul speaks about being a wise master builder in verse 10. He's writing again to the Corinthians, wanting them to obtain their reward. And he says in verse 11, No man can lay a foundation other than the one which is Christ. If any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident for the day. What day? We know what that day is. The judgment day. The day will show it because it is to be revealed. There's our word again. Shown, manifested with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built upon remains, he shall receive reward. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire. And so here's the idea here. In, in the ancient days, uh, a temple, you could say, would be made of gold and silver and precious ornaments and stones, whereas a mud hut would be made of mud and straw and stubble and kind of packed together. Both could be subjected to fire or flames, and one's going to stand and one's going to just go up in smoke. And there's a picture almost as if the person caught in that fire jumps out of the window at the last minute and he himself is spared, but everything that he is invested in is burned. If he has invested in wood, hay, and stubble. But if it is gold, silver, and precious stones, also speaking potentially of even gradations among that, gold is different than silver, which is different than precious stones, those things will last. It speaks of fire, that purifying agent in Scripture that we see. And so that's an illustration of what Paul is getting at here in 2 Corinthians. So this morning we've seen five very alarming realities so far. The subjects, it's us. The certainty, it's going to happen. As sure as the seat that you're sitting in, this will occur. The location before Christ at his bema the purpose to pay back, and the standard, what is useful and what is useless. I need to give you a sixth point before we leave today. 
because it's important to have the proper mindset when, uh, when preparing for our final exam. And that is the sixth point. What is the proper mindset? I mean, because if you're, if you're like me, you're feeling the weight of this a little bit, and you're like, wow, this is Jesus. What, what is the mindset that I am to have? As Francis Schaeffer used to say, how shall we then live in light of all of these truths? How should we live? You must live with the proper spiritual frame of mind, the right mindset. May I suggest it should not be a mindset of fear, although it's Jesus we're talking about here. It's Jesus that we'll be standing in front of, but the Apostle John says that perfect love casts out all fear. So it's not a, a situ- an issue of fear. It's further not an issue of merit-based works of salvation, merit-based achievements, performance-based religions. Christ has performed for our justification. The proper mindset in in, in preparation for this exam, can I point you to it? Look above one verse. I kind of glossed over it. The preparation is in verse 9. Therefore, we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. We just just want to please him. That's the ambition. That's the mindset we need to have. Not that I got to work and he's watching and I got to perform and I can't mess up. It's that we just want to please him. We just want to love him. We just want to serve him. We've been given so much, and so we give our lives in this sense of an all-absorbing ambition. The ambition here speaks of what we strive for, because you can strive for so many things, so many ungodly ambitions, but just he just wants our ambition to be him, to be pleasing to him, it says, heavenly-minded, and endeavor <clears throat> to do the things that please not man, but Christ. It was poet. C.T. Studd, who wrote those famous words, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And it's true. That is the mindset. Working for Christ, serving Christ. As we wrap this message up, I wanted to be very practical with this, and I wanted to include some closing, I guess, warnings or closing advice as we seek to be pleasing to him in our lives and all that we do, I think it's fair to say that if we really want to please the Lord with our lives, with our time, with our treasure and talents, first of all, we should probably be very aware of the dangers of spiritual apathy, right? I mean, I hope this just stirs your heart a little bit today that we ought not be apathetic spiritually. Can Christians be lulled to sleep Absolutely. They can be lulled by what is just kind of the norm, kind of what happens week after week, and you can be coaxed into just kicking back and riding out your Christian experience with your feet on the deck and your hands behind your head, and it's just blah, blah. And yes, your sins are covered, but the point is, Christian, now you're in the game. Now you're in the race, and now you must run. Now you must run with that burning hot fervor and desire to please your Lord, and it's time for you, Christian, now to go for broke. And don't you think that there won't be a final accountability for your spiritual apathy and for your spiritual laziness? There will be. Are you carrying out the responsibilities Christ gave you? Are you investing in what God has entrusted to you? And as I said before, for some of you, it's going to work every day and being faithful and being a witness for the Lord with your faithful work. Beware of spiritual apathy. Second, beware of competitive rivalry. Oh, dear. Competitive rivalry. Listen, some of us run this race fast, right? And some of us run this race slow and all the rest run the race somewhere in between. And you, Romans 14, are not to judge your brother. Romans 14, 12 says that each man himself will answer to God. Each man himself will give an account, not his brother. And sometimes we look at our brother's giftedness or our brother's lack of giftedness, and we become frustrated. 
and we ought not do that. We're not competing against one another. There's not only one first prize. We can all come in first, and if we're not careful, we can all come in last, and we don't want that. But there's no competition here. In fact, when I run my race full bore, and I see you next to me running full bore, what does that do? That spurs me on, right? That encourages me all the more to run faster and run harder, not because I'm racing you, but because I'm racing who? Who's, who am I competing against? Me and my own flesh and my own fallenness and my own lack of priorities. And I'm in this race looking to Jesus, not my brother. I'm looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith. And we run the race that is set before us. But in the same token, when you're lagging behind and when you're shuffling along, or when you're kicking back and saying, I'm just going to sit down, I'm going to sit this lap out, does that not affect my race as well? Can I see you doing that? And I say, well, why am I running so hard? This is working out for him. She's doing great just hanging out. Why, why should I put the effort in? And you actually become a stumbling block to me. Do you see that? <laughs> but when you are red hot on fire, when you are running fervently for the Lord, boy, that motivates me and that causes me to catch up. And we're not competing with each other here. We're spurring one another on as the day approaches, Hebrews 10, 24. Beware of spiritual apathy. Beware of competitive rivalry. And thirdly, beware of sinful activity. We've talked a lot about sin today, right? We've talked a lot about how it is not held against us judiciously, but we would be foolish to say that sin does not affect our race, right? It affects our race tremendously. It affects our endurance. It affects our spiritual stamina. It affects, uh, it affects our decision-making. It, it affects our clarity of mind, our strength, our peace, our joy. Sin fouls the conscience, clouds the judgment, draws discipline from the Lord, and brings reproach. Oh, yeah, sin affects this. And I understand that it's forgiven. How many times do we need to say that this morning? But it still affects us. Of course sin has an effect. Look at David and his sin, his sexual sin, and look how it affected him permanently. Look at Moses and his sin of anger and how it permanently kept him out of the land of Canaan. Look at Ananias and Sapphira, two people going to the church and carried out dead. Of course your sin affects you. You can't just so compartmentalize your life that say, well, I'm saved and I'm forgiven, past, present, and future, so now I just sin all I want to do. Oh, no, you're going to suffer. You're going to be way down in your race and you're going to be way last. Shed that. Hebrews says, lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Does it not? It entangles. And so these warnings are important to us as we seek to please him. Well, I hope this has been helpful to you today. I hope you are encouraged and not discouraged. Your reward is at hand. Behold, I come quickly, he says. Be in that category of well done, thou good and faithful servant. And don't be lagging behind in diligence, but instead be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, as Paul told the Romans. In conclusion, I just want to leave these last words of Charles Spurgeon. I can always rely on him for encouragement. Spurge, preaching on this very text, no doubt doing a much finer job than what you've witnessed today, he, he wrote these words to encourage us. He says, From henceforth, my brethren, the one great thing we have to care about is to please our Lord. You are saved. Heaven is your portion. And now from this time forward, concentrate all your strengths, all your faculties, and all your energies upon this one grand design, to be acceptable with Jesus. Live for him as he has died for you. Believer, it ought to be your ambition to please Christ in every act you do. 
Oh, cry to him to keep your motives clean, pure, elevated, heavenly. Labor, brethren, with a divine ambition to please Jesus Christ in your thoughts, in your wishes, in your desires, in everything that is about you. And Spurgeon is a realist, so he says, I know you will have many things to lament about, many shortcomings and errors. There will be much about you that will be displeasing to him, but take care that it is also displeasing to you and never be pleased with that which does not please him. Good words from the Prince of Preachers, and I hope that that is your sentiment and your prayer today. Let's stand as we're dismissed in prayer. <clears throat> Father, I just give you thanks for this great people, this wonderful congregation. Lord, thank you for their heart. Thank you for their faith. Thank you that you have given them new life, Lord. Now would you give them new energy? Would you just... Would you just feed them on your truth? Would you fill them with your spirit so that they would have energy to run this race with endurance? Would they not grow tired? Would they not grow weary? Would they be on guard against sin in their lives? And would they avoid competition? And of all things, would they avoid apathy in this race? Lord, this is such an important race. Father, we will all stand before the judgment seat of your son. You have appointed a day in which he will judge the world. Thank you, Lord, that we get to experience grace. <laughs> Thank you that we do not get to experience the lake of fire, but our words, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. But because of that, Lord, we run and we serve red hot on fire for you. May this be a reality in the lives of each and every one here, we pray. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Amen. You are dismissed.